So what I found over the years in training different salespeople is that you fall in one of those two categories. Either you're the person that's the communicator and they're, you're good at communicating or you're kind of the organized person. And if you can marry the two, the world is your oyster. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, that that definitely could put a scare in you. I remember my daughter, when uh, somebody told her a story about an alligator in a bathtub. And for years, she was so afraid. Somebody had to be in there with her. She was just afraid that an alligator was going to be in the bathtub somewhere. But, you know, and it's the things we create in our own mind that, yes. uh, that determine our own fear. Most of it is, and we were talking about this on our ID, the fear sometimes is a gift, but a lot of times it's just anxiety that is just creeping up in the back of our mind that we need to break through. And we tell these stories that aren't real, that, that there's, there's nothing to be afraid of normally. But there are times where we need to, to listen to that voice. So. Yeah, yes, there's a fine line there. And um, actually, I made a post about this the other day, Miles. It was um, two things that are very commonly mistaken for each other. You have fear and you have intuition. And to me, they're two very different things, but almost the same. I, you know, I think you put, hit the nail on the head. There is that intuition, that little voice that is normally right. But then there's the panic, which if it's a panicky fear, it's usually wrong. And in my work in coaching people with public speaking, there is that irrational fear about getting in front of an audience like we're going to be attacked or it's worse than death. And a lot of people just can't overcome it. And we see people in front of an audience all the time and nothing happens to them <laughs> and they survive. Yeah. But yet we're in front of an audience. Sometimes we feel our heart rates go up. We feel that nervousness and those are natural things but they're they're really not based on anything that's going to happen to you 99.9 yeah. percent of the time yeah yeah and it, it takes a true awareness i think to be able to distinguish and and when i was looking you know some i'll, I'll think these things and i'll kind of dig deep a lot of times and when it comes to the difference between fear and intuition a lot of times when it's fear, it is put into you by thinking about what other people are going to think or what other people have told you. Oh, you shouldn't do that because you're never going to make it because only 5% of the people that try that do it. Or, hey, the last person that I heard did that broke their ankle. Or, you know. You're, you're right. We create these scenarios that haven't happened yet. And we create a negative potential scenario instead of visualizing the positive scenario and trusting that that'll be the case. And that takes a little bit of practice. Most Olympic athletes today, they're before the event occurs, they are reviewing it in their mind thousands of times and seeing the most perfect way it's going to occur, especially gymnasts. And so you look at them do that. It looks effortless, but they have done that event thousands and thousands of times they know exactly how they're going to land in their mind and guess what it happens and so they overcome those fears by action over and over and over again and that, that th that's what we have to do in our life sometimes we're faced with something challenging we have to go to the powers of visualization to see it before it occurs but what do we do we visualize the negative and guess what happens yeah <laughs> the negative happens like it's like trying to hit the driver down when you got that big old lake to the to the right yeah, it's of like man. oh i want to i don't want to hit the lake yeah the last thing in your mind is i'm gonna hit lake, the lake 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 <laughs> yeah yeah it's like it's whatever you say or think whether you are for it or against it i mean that's usually where the body goes you know yeah yeah no very cool so let me ask you miles when, when you first got into the workforce I don't know, 16, 14, 17. What, what was your first like real job in the books? Well, my first job in the books, my father had a construction company. And I, on the, in the summers when I stayed with him, I would go to work with him. And as soon as I got there, it would be I'd empty all the trash. And then I'd go out with a work crew, and we would dig uh, foundations for swimming pools. And, and down in South Florida, there's different – there's sandy soil, there's mucky soil, and if you're building a swimming pool in the mucky soil, you have to put grade beams on and all sorts of things. So we would dig into the, the mucky. <laughs> it was oh. not fun. <laughs> no, it's intense. <laughs> but it taught me work and what hard work is, and then you 
put the steel be steel uh, rebar in and, and then you lay the concrete and you do all those things but it really gave me a uh, total respect for working in hard labor and what that means and and it, w it was uh, foundational to what a work ethic is and showing up on time and cleaning up after yourself and all those things that are really important to have a productive outcome yeah, yeah I think you know every job whether you love it or hate it they have there's lessons and I think you know, a lot of times when I look at my life, I look back at all the different things I did. And a lot of times there was no rhyme or reason. But like we were saying earlier about connecting the dots, I was like, man, that's so crazy. I remember when I first got into waiting tables, you know, bartending. I actually was a gig worker. Like there's a actually gig workers union here. That's like the only union I think in Florida. And it was for like big uh big conventions and that kind of stuff you know so all these little things have just let you know added up in every single thing that i've done i mean i'm using it today you, you certainly know? are in your promotional business your yeah how you reach out to the community how you can relate with these different venues that you use for for the entertainers that come in you speak their language yeah yeah and and even i remember you know working at shiners you know, it's attention to detail. You know, we would, when when we were training, you know, I had my department and then somebody would come in and check. You know, all those little, little things. I can go back as far as, as you know, as far as I can remember when I used to cut grass in the neighborhood. I was 11, 12 years old, knocking on people's doors. Hey, guys, you know, I live right up the road. You know, your grass is a little high. I got my lawnmower here. You know, you could just give me whatever. You're a born entrepreneur. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and all those little things, you know. And I was so shy. Were you shy when you were young? I, I you know, it's funny. Uh, I'm okay in front of a group, but in, in a group, in the herd, I get a little tense because I, f I feel like what, what's going to happen in this crowd, inside of a crowd. And I'm, I am working on that. That's been something I've struggled with. So I'm, I'm kind of both. Like, it, like in this venue, I'm fine. You know, this is going to go out to an audience. I understand that, and I'm okay with that. Or if you gave me a microphone on, uh, do, to do a karaoke song, I'm good with that. But if you threw me in the audience, you said, I need you to talk to these 50 people in the audience that you don't know. Whoa. Yeah. I get, I ha that I have to work on. So that's my little piece. And that's an important thing when you're networking. So what I've found is when I have to do that, when I have to go to a chamber event or when I – find myself in those situations. I always phone a friend. I always ask somebody that I know to come with me so I have a friendly person oh, in the audience wow. so that I'm not just talking about me, I'm talking about them, and then they can talk about me. So it's, it makes it a little bit more comfortable. So that's my little tool that I use as I bring somebody with me or ask somebody to come. So it makes being in that environment better. That It makes a lot of sense. Um, I've... Like my kind of shy when I was young was like I didn't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> like I wouldn't even order food at a restaurant. Wow. Oh yeah, it was bad. I wouldn't pay for stuff at wow. the cash register. Oh yeah, it was that. It was really like that. Even through school, I mean, I was always like really, really shy. I was afraid to ask questions to the teacher. Wow. So even now you're I, promoting. You're getting in front of the microphone. You're introducing well, the the. The performers. I mean, that's inc what a shift. I know. And I remember really where the shift happened was all my friends, you know, we, I was working a lot of my jobs, you know, wasn't really talking to people, you know, it was like behind the scenes, labor stuff. And then all my friends were getting jobs in restaurants. I started seeing these people making money. And as soon as I was old enough, I think I was 18, 19, you know, to serve tables. And I was like, all right, well, man, I'm scared, but I'm going to do it. And man, when I connected, I said, well, okay, here's the thing, Al, this is, this is happening. Like people like to talk to you. Like people come in and request your section and you're brand new and people just want to come have dinner with you. And I think it's that smile, Al. I don't know what I, I it, think is, it is. I think you got that window I smile. never understood what it was. I'm like, well, this, this equals money, <laughs> you know, like it's, I'm, I'm having fun. These people like talking to me. And then that, that's when I started coming out of my show, you know? <sighs> Can you imagine if that didn't happen? Yeah. What did I mean? It's and I think a lot of people are like that, and they just never had the opportunity, or it, the series of events didn't occur to allow them to overcome that fear. And we're only as strong as the weakest link. 
and it affects everything in your life. So when you overcome that fear, it, it affects everything down the line. Did 100%. you find that to be the case? I mean, oh yeah, I mean it was huge. And that that like a lot of times I have to go back to that moment because fear is natural. We all have it, you know. And sometimes I find myself like cocooning up a little bit with follow up. And these are things that I'm working on, you right, know. And right. Being in sales, you know, a lot of times I have so much confidence in that initial meeting right but if it doesn't happen in that initial meeting now my anxieties kick in right you know and and that's i mean it's that's a big thing that i've been working on and you know like having you coaching us is huge for me because wow. it's things that i kind of know but you need somebody to tell you well i appreciate that it, you know it, that is one of the foundational things that a lot of salespeople get trapped in they they put so much emphasis on the first presentation, but they don't have a planned way of follow up. Yeah. And people that are very organized naturally build those plans in place. They may not be comfortable with the presentation part, but they are they're gonna always win because they got the plan in place on the follow up. They're organized. They don't let things yes. fall between the cracks. And so what I found over the years in training different salespeople is that you fall in one of those two categories. Either you're the person that's the communicator and they're, you're good at communicating or you're kind of the organized person. And if you can marry the two, the world is your oyster because very that's, few people can build that other skill that they're weak at. But if you can do that, just like you overcame your shyness in the restaurant field, if, you can, if, if we can all take a look at ourselves in the mirror and say, what, where's my weak point and work on that, it strengthens everything. Yeah, and that's that's kind of really where I'm at. You know, my my follow-up, it's it's lacking, you know, but it's gotten so much better. There you go. It's improved. You know, yes, very and, much so. And but. I think we're, all, we're the hardest on ourselves. You know, yeah. what you think is, is uh, you know, what you describe as lacking, somebody might say, wow, Al's got it <laughs> together. So we're always most critical of ourselves. And that's, yes. it, you know, we need, sometimes we need to say, you know, it's not as bad as I think I still want to improve. Yeah. A and that's sometimes we can derail ourselves if we're too critical. You're right. It's yeah. in that's, that comes into the self-talk. Yes. And we've, we've had the conversations yeah. and I, I sometimes, I mean, and it's usually after I say, it, I'm like, man, you got to stop saying that because yeah. you're going to keep on believing it. You know, it's, it's, it's what we t open this discussion about. It's we're creating that picture for the future. So if we're constantly beating ourselves up, we become that person that we described with our self-talk. Like, oh, yeah. I'm a loser. Why did I do that? And I shouldn't have done this. And time out, time out. How many good things did you do today that we we took for granted. How many uh, did I get to pick up my daughter from school on time? Yes. Did I make the bed today? Yes. Did I eat healthy today? Yes. Did I remember to call my wife and just check in on her today? Yes. Did I call my friend that no, you know, I haven't spoken to in a while, made his day? Yeah. Did I remember to wish Aunt such and such and so and so happy birthday? Yes. So we do all the good things throughout the day, but we find that one thing we screwed up on and just beat ourselves up for two weeks on it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we, no, great. It's like point. let it go, you know, learn from it, then let it go and move on because it's holding you. It's like a little weight holding you down. Yeah, yeah, man, I, that makes so much sense, and I'm I'm guilty. You know, I'm very, well, I'm, I'm very, guilty too. I'm a very positive person, and yeah. you know, it takes a lot to derail right. my mood, I guess, right. and my state of mind. But I always have that, you know, like those little weights, just not let me get to the ultimate me. You know, and, and I hit, I do hit it sometimes, you know, but, uh, I tell you the one bastion where if you think you've got it together is when people are in traffic and that is like the acid test. The other acid test is how are you around family? We're all going to find out Thanksgiving coming up. Those are the kind of two things that always will check. How well do you have it together? Did you blow up at somebody in traffic? or not like and so i have a little uh trick i, I if you if you don't mind i'd love to share it w with you oh uh, please do that's yeah. what this is so about. Tra traffic you know we've all been on i-95 we you know uh we've been in port st lucie traffic with everybody moving in it's testing everybody's patience so what i do and it's it usually happens anytime you're driving 
somebody's going to cut you off or somebody's going to not put their blinker on or somebody's going to run that red light. And so what I do is I, I prepare myself mentally. It's like I wish them a most benevolent outcome to their trip. And so what it does for me is it, it diffuses the anger. I wish I do want them to get to their destination safely. I do. So instead of like being upset at them, I want them to get there safely. And so that then it you can't feel anger and a positive thing at the same time. So so I already have that in my back pocket. So if somebody cuts me off, I'm like, okay, they must be having a rough day. I hope they get to where they're going safely. And I got the best compliment I've ever receive from my daughter I don't get to see her that often so we were riding around in the car she's 24 and I was up visiting she's like dad something's changed like you're like really calm driving in traffic I'm like, nice. <laughs> like what uh. and she's like what are you doing I'm like I explained that to her and it's just so I have to I have to I have to pat myself on the back on that one I was like wow my daughter realized it so <laughs> obviously I I was a little angry before when I was trying <laughs> yeah, hey man, growing. It's all so about growth. So that's my tip: is is have that in your back pocket when you're driving. Is yeah, we all want that person. We don't want anybody to get hurt out in the road, even if they did something stupid. We want them to get there safely. So just wish them safe passage and and chalk it up. There must be running late or they're having a bad day, and and move on. Yeah. But how, how often have we in the past? You know that they cut us off ten minutes ago, and we're still. Oh, driver, and then the next person does it, and then it amps it up and amps it up, and then yeah. our and then drive. You're looking for somebody to do right, something to right, you, right? So that's my that's my little driving tip. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I'm, I've I think I've been blessed with with some serious patience and tolerance. Yeah, yeah you're you're pretty. You good. know, when it comes to you know the, like I say, I'm I'm not one to really toot my own horn much, but you know, like that lady says, toot toot. <laughs> right. But really, like it takes a lot, man. I I'm very when I'm around people that are not being nice right. or doing things in my mind, I always go back to, and I don't know where I learned this, but you know, Hey man, they're probably having a bad day. Right. What can I do to make their day better? There you go. You know, uh, and it, it really helps. And some yeah. people, when, when you actually can connect and some people, and I've, I love, this is one of my favorite things when I hear, Man, I really needed that right now. So good. God, man, so I good. live for that feeling. I got goosebumps right now just thinking about Has how that, that ever feels. happened at like Terra Formata? You got oh, a big, all the time. big crowd and something just going all haywire? All the time. Well, you know, it's not – actually, I say all the time. The kind of people that go there, what, I, what I've found, and this is kind of what I've been trying to build my life. I think it's a little bit slower going. Right. But it's so much more satisfying is I like to be around my tribe. Right. You know, and what I've found is a lot of the like real music fans, people right. that like to go somewhere and just let go and enjoy music yes. for what it is and how it is. They're usually very happy people. That's what I've noticed there, too. But every now and again, there's but, some, there'll be some but then you oddball, have, right, that sticks out. Yes. Then you have, you know, I've, oh, man, you don't have you don't have Moscato. <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah, I have, I'm like, well, I got this, this, and this. It's a great band. They're here from North Dakota. You know, like, you know but so yeah, it, it does. You know, there are the few people. But and what, how it's the same. Like when you're driving, right? In my mind, I'm like, man, this guy's probably having a bad day. Be extra nice to him. A, a you good, know? a good friend of mine worked at a, a top restaurant in New York City, and the waiting list to get in was like two months. And there was one gentleman who had to answer the phones and say, no, I'm sorry, we can't seat you tonight. But what he would say is, sorry to disappoint. And that, like, diffused him immediately. Oh, wow. And yeah. then he's like, sorry to disappoint, but we can book you, you know, you two months from now. Yeah. Softens it, it up sorry a little bit. To, sorry to disappoint, you know. And, yeah. and that was, uh, I was like, wow, what a nice way to soften it up a little bit. You yeah. know? And then you explain the reason is. We have a limited whatever, you know, whatever the reason is. We have all these other things that you might want to try. Would you like to try X, Y, and Z? Yeah. You know, I'll give you a little sample, see what you think. So, I mean, this you are very well-versed in this when it comes to communication and, you know, personalities. I know being in construction, you didn't – that wasn't what really, what really kind of got you down that path. When did you – 
what was your first job to where you went into, I guess, sales or customer service or somewhere where you had to find this? Well, the, the real turning point was I've got a job as a manufacturer's rep and I would travel to different supply houses throughout Florida. And a friend of mine said, you know, you should do Toastmasters. I'm like, what is Toastmasters? I had to do nothing about it. And then I was reading an article in Kiplinger's Guide to Finance, what, what to do if, if you had $1,000. And they, everybody said, well, invest in yourself. And one of their recommendations was join Toastmasters. And for those in the audience who don't know what Toastmasters is, they're a nonprofit organization that's been around for, I think, 70 years, started by Ralph Smedley. And their goal in life is to help people overcome their fear of public speaking, to get better at public speaking. And they meet on a weekly basis. There's, I think there's a chapter here at Port St. Lucie, or, or probably two or three chapters. And people have an opportunity to per perfect their sp speaking skills and help each other in the group. So I joined the one in Coral Gables, and I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. And they have oh, wow. speaking contests, and it really helped me see what you can do when you're speaking in public and what the stumbling blocks are and how do you improve it and how to take feedback from people and how to not go, uh, uh, um, you know, these are little ticks that people lean on when they can't think of what to say next. And there's ways of getting past that. And that was kind of the opening thing. And I loved it. And I kept a membership for many years after that. And that's what kind of gave me the confidence to start this business on helping people with their communication. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. never knew that. Yeah. Makes total sense. Yeah. So when you were when you were a, a brand rep, so you would go out to accounts and pretty much sell them. What was what was the uh, product? Uh, PVC pipe, uh, valves, fittings. Uh, there was a special valve that we had uh, that would go on an active water line that you could call the saddle valve that you could put on a line and create a coupling to that thing. And I would go around to do pull through marketing. I would go to different hospitals and things like that. We did, couldn't sell directly to them, but that gave them the, de you know, made demand for the product so that people were like, oh, I got to get that. And so I would do help our supply houses introduce this product to their customers. Okay. So that gave me that uh, first, like, here's a product demonstration, you know, using a drill and drilling through a live pipe and putting a valve on it in front of a group of plumbers here's a salesman showing plumbers how to put a valve on a pipe they're like who's this who's this joker going to show me and they're like wow i gotta have one of those yeah <laughs> so that was that was a fun experience where you realize your demonstration skills are selling a product so that was an eye-opener for me yeah very very cool man so in so you were doing the pipe fittings um how how were you able to i guess I don't want to say create passion, but I think you're going to have to create some passion to be able to be excited about doing that. What was your connection there? Well, <laughs> it's it's amazing. When you're on the road making calls, you end up meeting other salespeople. And I was always open to feedback and I was asking other, and that's a good tip for, for the audience, anybody starting out, is always try to find those senior successful people and ask them for tips and advice. And I was always good at that because, again, my curiosity – and this one person I met, he's like, you've got to get, while you're driving on the road, you've got to listen to audio tapes. You've got to be educating yourself while you're driving. I'm like, where do I get these tapes? He's like, you can buy them from this company, Nightingale Conant. You can run and get them from the library. In fact, it's funny, before we started the meeting today, it's like, how many people in the audience don't even have a library card? It's crazy to think about, but the library's got all these free resources there. And today, with a library card, you get an app on your phone, and you can download so many of their books and collection are on audio if you're driving in the really? car. Really? Yes. Free? Free. Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. So I'm, I am a member of Audible, and they're like $15 a month, and I highly yeah, recommend that. I have that. that. But free. You go to your local library, get a library card. Now, what else does a library have? Access to so many resources. So if you're, again, going into sales, you're in real estate, and you want to research something about a company or an industry, 
they've got access to all sorts of stuff. Again, free. Just ask your librarian and they'll help you out. But people kind of just drive past it and well, they I, just neglect all the resources that are right there for you. The, I'm, I use them all the time, the library. Well, let me ask, do you think there is a difference between Google and the library? There's a 100% difference. Google is great if you know what you want to look for. But what's cool about the library is you're walking through a section and you might stumble upon something, a book that you would normally not find oh, wow. on Google because Google is going to distract you and take you to with their ads and things like that. But when you're researching something in the library, you're in the reference section. And let's say you were like this happened to me a few months ago. I was like I was somehow interested in uh, archaeology in Florida. And then I went to another section, another section, but found out all this information about wet archaeology in Florida. I knew nothing about it. And there are these sites in Florida that are 15,000 years old that are in these hot springs of Florida where they actually found, and this just blew my head, they found an intact skeleton that's like 12,000 years old with still brain matter inside this Wow. This in, in part of Florida. I, n I never knew anything about it. It was when the sea levels were at a different level and this Native American got stuck and then the sea level rose or the spring rose and his body got preserved because of the acidity in the water. Oh, wow. And his bones and everything maintained. Now, as soon as they bring that up, all it starts dissolving right away. But there's just, I'm never going to stumble on that on Google. Yeah. Right, because it's going to take me here, it's going to take me there. But when you're rummaging around a library, you're going to find things that you're never, you're just not going to run into. That Google. makes so much sense, yeah. and I've never thought of it. Yeah. Well, so that's I mean, the difference. I need to go pay my uh, – <laughs> Your library fine? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much it is, but I know. Hey, hey, you know what? They've forgiven you. Oh, you think? I think they. Are. I don't know. Man, I'll, I'll split it with you. I'll split it with you. I'm scared to walk don't, in. I think they're listen. gonna be, have the cuffs waiting for me. Don't listen to those fears. That's <laughs> that's not intuition. Okay. Now. That is not. <laughs> oh my God! I love that. So the library guys, get your library card back. I'm telling you. You know, and and the universe has its ways of giving you signs and putting stuff in front of you. And I'm I'm a big believer in that. I don't know how you feel about that, but like. I, I'm not a big believer in chance. I think chance is something that does have a cause, but we just can't put our finger on it. What do you think about that? Well, I, I do I believe in synchronicity. And I think that if if it happened, it happened, and we have to honor that it happened. And it, the flip side of that is that sometimes bad things happen that we just can't figure out. And so that's the hard pill to swallow. When things, crazy stuff happens, you're like, how, how did that happen? And, you know, we have a lifetime to figure these, you know, tragedies out. But I do think everything has a purpose and a reason to it, even though if it, it doesn't appear at the moment. And, and, you know, it is hard to swallow when a tragedy does happen. You're like, why did that happen to me? And it may not be evident in this lifetime. It may be a series of things that, that, that happened. So that's my philosophy on it. it. You know, is there such a thing as randomness? They've t done studies where they take so-called random occurrences, uh, what would they used to call chaos, and they find patterns within the chaos. Even um, radioactive decay and different particles that they use to do ra random number generators, they can take these random number generators and get a group of people focusing and concentrating to ch to change the probabilities of these random numbers coming off and that creates a a non-random situation just based on people's thought so is i mean mm -hmm. how do you explain that and so so these are these are studies that at Princeton University that have gone on and so is that chance or not so so th these are things we just don't understand in modern science how you can change a random number generator did not produce random numbers just by people focusing on it with their thought. I'm a huge believer in it. I think, you know, when it comes to all matter, stuff you can touch, stuff you can't even see, it's all energy-based. Yes. Frequencies. Frequencies, exactly. Yeah. And 
there's a connection. I think there's a connection between everything. And it's just so much of it is unexplained. You can't notice it, well, but we, it's there. It's it's while we're limited in the spectrum of light that we can see with our eyes, what we see with our eyes based on the full light spectrum if you take microwaves and ultraviolet right we we can't see ultraviolet we can't see infrared right but if we just look at the percentage of what we can see with our eyes is like i don't know like a thousandth of a percent of the full light spectrum yeah so there's oh, yeah. there's Imagine. so much we can't see yeah and we're judging things based on this limited perception of what we can see and we're like, well, I didn't see it. So it didn't occur. Well, eat some mushrooms. Now, see it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, birds like pigeons and, and different animals have ability to see these different colors. Yes. Uh, like spider webs. They look a certain color to us, but insects see like a flashy color that the spider web tracks what they found attracts. I mean, how amazing is that? That the spider yes. not only has a sticker sticky web, but the, filament produces a color that attracts insects to it I mean, uh, yeah, you tell me beautiful. nature doesn't have intelligence i mean that is unbelievable yes but we man. can't we can't see it yeah how about For, cats i think cats can see a bunch oh, of stuff they can, we can. oh cats That's, i think cats see spirits and ghosts they're oh, well people see spirits and ghosts have you i have not seen a ghost uh, or of spirit, but I've definitely been in places where the hair has stood up on my body, and I, there was definitely some weird vibes going on. Yeah. But, well, I think when when you know we're we're all an energy field. Yeah. And I feel that when you pass, we do know that energy cannot be created nor destroyed; it just gets transferred or moved. So when somebody passes, I mean their energy is somewhere, and I think some people. And I don't know what causes it, but some people's energy field stays intact in some ways. Well, it's it's so amazing we're having this conversation. There's a great book, The Holographic Universe, that talks about these different things. And if we look at, he start opens the book with a scene from Star Wars with uh, Princess Leia. If Obi-Wan, come save me, right? That was the first representation of a hologram in a movie. And... When we make a CD, if we look at a CD, you can't see the music yeah. on the CD, but we know that it's there, and you look at it, and you move the CD in your hand, and there's all these weird colors on it, but then you put it and shine a laser through it, and all of a sudden we get ons and offs that we translate into music. So if we're a vibration, we can see in this spectrum with our eyes, but if our essence is a vibration that doesn't need a body, uh, then is it really in any place? Is it, is, or is it just part of all the vibration? So it, it's really opens up a whole, you know, when you start thinking about the world that way, like what is place, what is time? You know, it, you look at a CD and it has all the whole album on there. It's all existing all at once that, if we look at it, just as an example, if somebody's lifetime is, is, is one CD, that's all at once on that CD. Yeah. And we can just look at pieces of it along the way. And, you know, you and I are experiencing this moment in this little piecemeal moment. But if we put it all in one, whatever format we put it on, you know, it used to be tape and now it's CDs and now we're using, you know, uh, RAM chips to put things on. I mean, is that RAM chip? We're gonna cut cut it in half and say <laughs> it's that half well, has it like you know what what hologram if you take a piece of it the small piece has the whole representation of the whole on a hologram. Yeah, and I it, think about this kind of stuff a lot, and I I'm still I still have a disconnect that I'm trying to figure out because a lot of the study is showing that everything is there time is not linear, like everything is already there. Right. So a big part of my life and things I've been trying to do is to understand how much control we really have. But where, where I have the biggest disconnect and I'm still trying to figure it out, and I think I'm always going to be figuring it out, but if it's already there, how much control do we really have? 
Well, that's the age old question. I, I think the control becomes in how we respond to any given situation is we can respond to it. And I always kind of boil it down to this question is life happening to you or is life happening for you? And is it am I the victim here or am I going to learn from the situation? So we, I think, have a choice on how we respond to it in that sense. Now, is uh, how I view the world as something unfolding already predestined or do I have agency to affect the outcome? And I think based on my experience, I think we do create our reality in, in a way. And you're saying, well, Miles, people have predicted certain events in the future that have come true. Yes. But I think we have the ability to change different outcomes to change. Maybe that reality was heading that way. I think there's multiple Dimensions. potential outcomes to different things. And I also, and this is kind of crazy, but I one of the exercises I do, and this is going to sound kind of weird, but and it's a, it's an easy exercise to talk about it, but it's very challenging to do. So before I go to bed at night, I kind of relive my day. And I think about, okay, I woke up in the morning and I took a walk. But if a challenging situation happens, I kind of rewrite the situation to the benevolent outcome of, of that. So what that does is it kind of erases that negativity there. And I think the more we do that, we actually, the more we change, can change our past, it affects our present and the future. So you're saying, well, Miles, you, you, you know, you're saying you, that, that trauma you had in your childhood? Yes, especially the trauma you had in your childhood. How do I change it from woe is me, there was a trauma in my childhood, to kind of take a higher view of it and say, wow, what a learning experience this was. Yes. And here's what my grandmother was feeling. Here's what my mom was feeling at the time. And here's why this happened taking the energy out of it. Now my life is changed because I'm not carrying that negative vibe about that event that, yeah, it was a traumatic experience, but now I've turned it into a learning experience. So in a sense, I've changed the past because I've changed my perspective about perhaps a trauma, traumatic experience. So I think we can have an impact on the past and I think we can have an impact on the future by the by virtue of what you said. We're all vibrations. So if we change our vibration, you know, if you, I don't know if you play guitar, Al, or not. No, but I so love the you, guitar. You love the guitar. So you know that when, when you get those guys up there and they're tuning the guitar and one string's out of tune, you can immediately tell. Yeah. So when your vibration of your life is out of whack, things are in, in discordant, right? You're not in harmony. And so you're not going to be in harmony with those good things in your life. And you said something so great. It's like, I want to be with my tribe. You know, what does that really mean? I mean, that means you want to be in a place that you're in harmony with the people around you that are vibrating at a harmonious level. Yes. And that's group resonance. Is I'm a mag big believer it's, it's in so that. magnifying. It's so yes. magnifying. We, you know, uh, Kurtan, you know, you know what that is, right? What is it? Kurtan, that's when, uh, you know, people chant and get together and they sing or you're in church and you're singing hymns together. Or you, if you're singing up, lifting music together, you start raising your vibration. Yep. And if you're around, sadly, the negative is also true. If you're in a place where everybody's complaining and woe is me and uh, the world's going to end tomorrow and everybody's criticizing each other. Oh, I steer the vibration <laughs> is going down and down and down. And all of a sudden the possibilities aren't there anymore and everything's negative. And, and so we may disagree on things, right? But let's t talk about the possibilities. How can we make it better? What can we do? How can we build these bridges? But if you focus on the negative, all of a sudden the possibilities get closed down. The energy gets closed down. And it's like we're gonna hit a wall. Oh, know? dude! That's, so that, that's, I believe this so much. <laughs> so that's man. the that's where I think why we're here. We're here to to learn, and we're here to lift each other up and raise that vibration. I mean, it's an easy way to say it, but what does that mean? It just means trying to put your brother's shoes on and take a walk and see what it's like in those moccasins and try to have that perspective. You know? Oh yeah, man. So let me ask you: you you spend a lot of time 
coaching, teaching, influencing people like myself. Um, what what are your resources? Like, do I I think I'm pretty sure we have to share some, but like, what what who do you like to follow on on social media? Who what books do you like to read? What are some of your biggest influences? Oh, such a great question! My goodness, it is really amazing how we are have so much at our fingertips today. Again, the library is is a great resource for me. I, I use it all the time. I'm listening. I'm listening to a book right now. I, I already referenced it, the Holographic Universe. Download it from the library. <clears throat> so that's a great book. I highly recommend it. And let me just give you the author of that book. Yeah. Well, this is where I bust out my pen. Okay. It's uh, <laughs> Michael Talbot. So and the and the book was written uh, in the early nineties. Okay. T a l b o t. T a l b o t. And he influenced so many people along the way. What's nice about this book is that he kind of looks at all these different areas and looks at the near-death experience and looks at out-of-body experiences, looks at scientific studies of this type of thing. So great book. On a different vein, one of my heroes, Zig Ziglar. Oh, yeah. I got to see him fortunately. I got to see him live down in Fort Lauderdale years ago. And he said something, and you know, at the time it sounded kind of trite. He said, you can have anything you want as long as you're willing to, to help people get what they want. And yeah. I'm here to tell you that is a true statement. That is a true statement because it takes the own, it takes that kind of selfishness off you. Like, oh, I want it. I want, I want. No, I want to help people get what they want. And I know that's kind of one of your philosophies, Al, is like, I, you're always like, how can I help people? How can I build community? How can I do that? So I, I know you already live and breathe that. Uh, another concept recently, and, and this, this came about, it was a turning point for me, is uh, my mom had uh, passed on, and I was cleaning out one of the rooms in, in, the, in the house. And I'm like, what, what book am I going to listen to next? And I found this book. Uh, and it, the concept of the book was ask for a benevolent outcome. You're like, well, what is that? You know, anytime you have an event coming up or anytime you're, you've got some important thing you're doing, or even if you're driving to the grocery store, say to yourself, I request a most benevolent outcome. And what's that doing? It's not a selfish request. Oh, I want the best parking space or, I want to win. It's I want the most benevolent outcome. And that implies something that's most benevolent for all involved. And because a lot of times what we think we want is maybe not the best thing for us. Mm -hmm. So if we're willing to trust that our higher self or however you want to call it, your higher angels or the universe, if you're willing to say, I, tr I they've got my back then why not request that most benevolent outcome? I equate it to, I think so, I, I don't know if it was uh, Wayne Dyer said, you know, if you, or no, it wasn't Wayne Dyer, but someone said, you know, if you're going to go to the ocean, why show up with a teaspoon? <laughs> yeah. Why not at least have a bucket, you know? And that's a lot of times what we do. We, we just like, oh, can I please a most benevolent outcome? Yeah. More than what I can expect but what's the best for everybody and that's how I approach business you know when I'm going into a training or we had a ride day earlier this week or last week I, it's like I want a most benevolent outcome for our time together it may and that may lead to something beyond what I expected even before this podcast sitting in the driveway you know I'm going to be on with Al I want a most benevolent outcome for our conversation together so that I, I that is a uh I challenge everybody listening to this to try that. And if that doesn't work, I want to know about it because it will change your life. Yeah, I, I love that, man. And like I say, these these things, sometimes you just have to hear it. Yes. You know, because, yeah, no, duh. I want everybody to be happy. You know what I mean? It's like right. you, people, but you have to really look at it and like put it into perspective and actually be like being have intent 
when you think that, you know, don't just, oh, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, of course. I want everything. No, go in there. And this this works, Miles. Yeah. And I, I thank you for it, you You're know, welcome. and really kind of you leave it. You leave it to the universe in a way. Yes. yes. But by doing that, it, it gives you pure your intentions exactly. feel more pure. Yes. Your actions are pure. Yes. Um, you have conviction. Yes. Because you know that what you're doing is for the best. I yes. mean, it's it goes deep. Yeah. And and you're showing up. It doesn't absolve you of the fact that you're not putting forth the effort. You're just asking for a most benevolent outcome. So the, the guy that the name of the book is The Gentle Way by Tom T. Moore is his name. And it's a it's a short, short listen. But and he shares all these little anecdotes throughout his life. And the, he used to have a ski club in Texas and he would drive and and just the little stories that he told. And he has a website that he has. But that's those are a handful, you, you know, on YouTube. Um, God, there's so much information. Oh, there. No, I mean, I you can get lost. It. My advice on YouTube is before you go on, decide what you want to listen to because you'll go down the rabbit hole. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, so that that is a, a, a something I recommend. But somebody I listen to a lot is a guy that does this uh, Reality Revolution podcast, for Brian Scott, and he Ooh, kind I of don't know that one. Yeah, Brian Scott. He re he reads a lot of these um, esoteric things and uh, about attracting things into your life, and and very very good. You know Joe Dispenza? Joe Dispenza is awesome. Yes. In fact, Joe's having a peace. If you go to his website, he, he had a peace walk a couple of weeks ago, and he's doing another one, I think, next month. So you can download. I, I don't know all the details, but if, it should be on his website. You can. Uh, he does a free one-hour peace walk, and I did. my wife and I did it on the beach. Oh wow! And uh, what do you listen to something? Yeah, while you're he walking? he does. Yeah, he does a peace kind of walking meditation oh, that wow. he guides you through, and I need to at do a that. specific time. And I, uh, Heidi and I did it together, and it was extremely powerful. Uh, we're, we were walking and thinking about sending out peace vibes throughout the whole planet, and I guess there was thousands of people oh, doing wow. it that day. And he's going to do another one here. Oh, so, yeah, set me up with some I'll of that you, info. I'll set you that. Because he's yeah. the one that got me into meditation. And a lot of oh. times what I'll do when I go out to the beach, I, like I try to be very active. A couple years ago, I made a big choice in my life, you know, the, hey, man, it's, I have children. I want to be the absolute best I could be. And it starts with my body, my mind, my soul. No doubt about you it. Medit know? Meditation is, you know, people poo-poo it and they say, well, what's happening? That's the point. Nothing's yeah. happening. But everything's happening. You know what? And you're tuning, you're tuning all the, you know, worry. You're trying to keep the worries off to a certain level. And you're like, I'm letting things rest, but I'm cultivating this ability to watch the mind. And so if I can cultivate that, all of a sudden the world changes because now I'm not reacting. I'm watching things and I can make better choices. And that's what meditations and then all sorts that's just all these other things start opening up we talked about how i can see with my eyes but some people will see things in their meditation that they can't see with their eyes so what's happening there you're opening yourself up to other dimensions in your meditation more information you're going to make better decisions and these are all possibilities that occur during meditation Yes, I love it. I yeah. love it. So having so. A, a, you know, specific time that you meditate. I like to meditate like at three thirty a.m. or before I go to bed at night. I've been doing my best to have a little routine. At about ten o'clock, I get a half an hour, and then I go to sleep. And I find that my dreams are more vivid, and I can remember them more if I meditate before I go to sleep. Yeah, I've uh, I've actually slacked off the last couple months. It feels like I've kind of gotten real busy right um but it's not an excuse because i remember this is funny when i was meditating for right. a while my life things I'm not gonna say just started happening right but i mean a lot, a lot of opportunities showed up and things a lot of things that i could capitalize on yeah. and i mean it just is a coincidence probably not i think, you're, I think you're more aware of it and your synchronicities will increase yeah and you'll have the courage. You're like, ah, oh, 
this feels right. You're going to be more in tune with what feels right and what doesn't. And this goes back to understanding your why. But when you're meditating, you're going to be more in tune with that. So you're going to be able to act on those. Just like when you were that little kid, you're like, oh, there may, people are making this money and they're doing uh, this. I've got to do that. Well, there was part of you that had the courage to do that. Yeah. Oh, I think yeah. when we're taking care of ourselves, our muscles and our body and the diet, but we have to take care of our soul too, and that's where the meditation comes in. Yes, very cool, man. Yeah. I I I love talking about all this stuff. I don't know if you could tell. I'm I could tell. Into <laughs> it, man. I'm into <laughs> that's it. That's good. So let's let's kind of I, I could talk to you all day, man. Yeah. But one one of the things a lot of the people listening, you know, we're gonna have people from in all different levels of entrepreneurships, all different levels of their career. But if you could just kind of sum up to the person that they feel like they got a pretty good idea and they, they want to start a business. What, what type of mindset do they need to be in? And not only that, what are some hacks or some exercises that they could do to number one, know if they're going to make the right move or just do it? Well, that is a, Great question. Number one, they have to be able to ask that question of themselves. Like, what is it? They have to be willing to learn. I, I always say, I can't take on a client that doesn't want to get better. Yeah. And I always use the example of Tiger Woods. I show a picture of Tiger Woods' as golf coach, and people don't know who that is. But if you show them a picture of Tiger Woods, they know. Why does the best golfer in the world need a golf coach? Because they want to get, he wants to be the best, he wants to yeah. get better. So you have to have that yearning to improve. But I would say the most important thing is find a peer that's a little further down the path than you. Somebody you can invite out to lunch. Somebody that's willing to take you under their arm and be your accountability partner. And you have to take it seriously. You have to show up. If you have an appointment with that person, you show up early. And you will follow some of the advice they give you they can hold you accountable. Then, as you get your grounding, offer to be an accountability for someone who's a fur kind of further back than you are. So together, you're building this up. And it takes it does take more than just one person to start a company, a foundation, or anything. You need people along that pathway that have been there before you that can show you the ropes a little bit. Yes, you're going to make it your own. But it's like somebody else did. It's like Roger Bannister running the four-minute mile. After he broke the four-minute mile, four of the runners within three months did it. Well, when you got somebody else that's been in your shoes in business, you're like, I can do this. That gives you the encouragement. So just seek those people out. Make them your accountability partner if they're willing to, and be accountability partner for somebody else. Those are my advice. I love that. I love that, man. That's uh, that's super strong. And once again, man, that's the, the people that are around you mean so much. Like when, when yeah. I made... Like I've, I've been blessed, you know, these past few years, you know, being into the real estate field and, you know, being around great mentors, but the same, you know, aligning back up. I've known Richie for years, Yes. you know, but aligning back up with him and just kind of, you know, I just wanted to, I wanted to be around and kind of be in these frequencies has done things like put me around people like you, Lee Haight, Brad Lee, oh. you know, and, and these, it's just, it's something special, man. And it goes a long way. And it does something for them as well. They're seeing the growth in the people. They're seeing that they're inspiring people and that gives them the juice in their tank. Cause once you get to a certain income level, it's not about that anymore. It's about how many people can I develop? Yes. And that starts feeding their tank. So I love it. And that's the beauty of it. Yes, yes, man. So, Mr. Miles, this has been amazing. Like I say, I could talk to you for hours about this stuff, man. I get lost in it. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, going the extra mile, this is, uh, I love what you do. There's not many people that do this that actually says, hey, I'm going to dedicate my life to doing this. And you're local. You're here in the area. I'm That's sure right. there's people over the world that do this, but you're here right. on the Treasure Coast. That's right. Doing it, man. So just any parting words for the people before we get out of here, you know, just give them a little, a little, a little something. Uh, to, my to parting words day. is we're all good at beating ourselves up, but take time every day, get your journal out and write down some things you did good today. Give yourself a pat on the back. Take it easy on yourself. It's a tough, it's tough out there. 
and uh, be grateful. Write down the three things you did good today and write down three things you're grateful for and keep it up. Make that a daily habit and your life will change. I love it, man. Well, thank you so much for being here. Miles McGrath going the extra mile. Guys, this was the Al Beltran podcast and we will see you soon. Thank <laughs> you.